12 years ago, as a student of economics at the University of Delhi, I watched this movie. This is Syriana. It's a movie that is about the geopolitics of the petroleum economy. This movie had it all. It had violence, it had terrorism, it had finance, corruption, it had mergers and acquisitions. It revealed to me what the world of energy really looks like. This movie had a profound impact on what I was to do later in my life. I decided then that I'm going to study and research and take up energy. Since then, I have worked in several institutions around the world that deal with energy. And I've learned some very fascinating things about how energy has influenced the very progress of humankind. Take the case of this gentleman, John D. Rockefeller. He was born in a small village to a conman father. Within a few decades, his Standard Oil Company went on to control 90% of all oil in the United States, and he went on to become one of the richest human beings to have ever walked the earth. This showed me how impactful energy can be in making individuals very rich very quickly. Of course, this man went on to also become the face of monopoly capitalism. The way he ran his company and the way he influenced the economy has been pivotal in the way the American economy has been shaped since then. I've also learned about how Norway has become really rich very quickly on the backs of energy. In the year 1969, oil was discovered in the country. At that point, they were already quite advanced as a nation. They decided then that instead of getting too addicted to this oil money, they're going to put it in a pension fund. And the year 1996, they started putting money into the pension fund. In a matter of just 21 years, this pension fund went on to become $1 trillion large. For every citizen of Norway, there is one crore rupees, all because of oil. Clearly, energy has a profound impact on the way nations become wealthy. The impact of energy has been far more profound. Take the case of space exploration. We've had a situation where, because of advances in solids and liquid fuels, human beings have been able to explore the solar system and beyond. In fact, science and technology has been very profoundly influenced by the advances in energy. Everything that you do, everything that, that you have in your hands has come on the backs of production processes, science, development, and technology that has ridden on the backs of advances in energy. Of course, not everything has been a result of science and progress and wealth and so on. Energy has also had negative influences on the society. There are some countries such as Venezuela, which have found themselves to be so attached to the petroleum economy that their exports, their government revenues, their politics, their society has been completely intermingled with the petroleum economy, leading to a case where the, the fortunes of the economy rises and falls with the prices of oil. This extends beyond that. This extends to, to international conflict and war. We have a situation where there have been uh, wars, there have been conflicts at the borders because of energy. Take the case of September 2019, just one month ago, when Saudi Aramco's facilities were bombed through uh, missiles as well as drones uh, uh, because it could have been Iran, it could have been Syria. People are still trying to find out. The point is, energy is at the heart of a lot of international conflicts. Clearly, as I've learned over the years, energy is very fascinating. Energy has also played a very vital role in influencing and contributing to the greatest existential threat that humanity has ever faced. Climate change has been enabled due to the human use of energy since the dawn of the industrial age. Take this graph from NASA. It begins 800,000 years ago. The CO2 levels have been fluctuating over all these 800,000 years. It's only in the last 150 years when industrialization really began that CO2 levels have shot up through the roof, leading to a lot of weather extremes, leading to, for example, increased frequencies and intensities of hurricanes. It's led to droughts, it's led to flooding, and a lot of other impact on human civilization. How do we solve this critical problem of our era? More energy, obviously. Better energy. So I've learned over the years how human beings have been trying to 
develop newer, more futuristic forms of energy that don't have a climate impact so that we're able to reverse what we have done over the last 150 years. This is the inside of a fusion reactor. Uh, we have been trying to replicate the kind of nuclear reactions that happen on the sun. We're trying to replicate that, that here on Earth so that we're able to create boundless energy without leading to climate change. Apart from nuclear fusion, we've been investing into hydrogen energy. So we, uh, when you burn renewable hydrogen, all that comes out at the other end is clean drinking water. We are trying to invest into carbon capture and storage, which is a way to grab the carbon out of the air and put it into the soil. In other words, we are trying to reverse what we did in the last 150 years. Of course, everyone here knows about the massive expansion of solar and wind that has taken place. The largest wind turbines today are in fact taller than the Statue of Unity in Gujarat. So you can imagine the scale and the size of what we are trying to achieve. But sometimes I wonder, when we're looking at all these futuristic forms of energy, all these amazing conversations that we're having around what the potential future of energy and climate change could look like, are we missing out on something that's a little more obvious, a little more invisible somewhere? So to explore that, let's have a look at this graph. This, by the International Energy Agency, is a result of the world energy model. This model looks at the technical, the economic feasibilities of different energy sources, given what we have, given what we can afford to do, and it tries to project over the next few decades where the energy system will end up. You know, we already know how much of a problem emissions are and how quickly they're contributing to climate change. We see that despite that, the trajectory that we're on right now, we will continue to keep rising our emissions year after year. This graph goes all the way to 2040, our emissions would have risen substantially until then. This trajectory that we are on is completely unsustainable. Therefore, to actually go to a new trajectory, a trajectory where climate impacts can be mitigated, where the Paris Agreement, where we have globally, all countries have agreed to limit climate change to less than two degrees from pre-industrial levels. So less than two degrees Celsius, that's what we are trying to achieve. That trajectory will lead to substantial cuts in emissions. But how do we get there? Do we have to sacrifice energy? Or what are the policy options and what are the technologies that enable us to get there? The International Energy Agency estimates there are a range of choices. These are technological and policy choices that we can take up. For example, we see that fuel switching, which is being able to convert industries from coal to natural gas, for example, can contribute to about 2% of our movement towards that new trajectory. Similarly, nuclear energy can contribute to about 6% of avoided emissions. Carbon capture and storage, about 9%. So all of this will play an important role in getting us towards this new trajectory that we're supposed to be on. Unsurprisingly, renewable energy, you know, the, the big wind turbines and the, and the very slick solar panels that we see, they can contribute to a substantial 36%. But in all these conversations of these cool technologies, we sometimes forget that energy efficiency can contribute to 44%. It's almost half of our way towards the new trajectory where climate change can be mitigated. Energy efficiency is something that is profound in its impact, but it's completely invisible, especially in our conversations and our understanding of what should be done. In fact, until the year 2040, we will see that energy efficiency alone can reduce two and a half times India's emissions globally. So today, India is the world's third largest emitter of, uh, of greenhouse gases. Imagine we're able to remove two and a half times India's uh, emissions by the year 2040. All of this will come from energy efficiency alone. The question then is, what is energy efficiency in the first place? Energy efficiency uh, is the ability to do as much as we're doing right now using much less energy, right? There are these technologies and, and, and processes that enable us to do that. Unlike everything else we have spoken about before, energy efficiency is inherently invisible. It's a little boring, in fact. Just think about it. There are no wars related to energy efficiency. There's no individual who's becoming really rich because of energy efficiency. There's no country like Norway making a pension fund out of savings from energy. So energy efficiency, these gains don't lead to something cool or, or fun, and therefore the conversations around energy efficiency are not happening. Where does energy efficiency really come from? So let's start by looking into our own homes, right? The, 
the most energy efficient air conditioner that exists today is about 35% or more energy efficient compared to the average that is available in the market. So if you're out there and you're going to buy a four star or five star uh, uh, energy label rated air conditioner, you'd be saving substantial amounts of energy. The same is true even in the case of uh, washing machines where the most energy efficient washing machines are at least 25% more energy efficient. It's the same as case with fans. The best fans in the market are 60% more efficient than the average ones available. Technologies like these have led to changes not just today. This is not something that has just existed in 2019. We have been actually pursuing this for the past several decades. Take the case of refrigerators. Since the year 1970, refrigerators have become 75% more energy efficient. That is, for the same amount of energy, now you can have four refrigerators running instead of just one. In fact, in 30 years, the United States has been able to avoid 70 million cars worth emissions only from energy efficient refrigerators. Right? So if we have, just imagine just with a flick of your fingers, you're able to get rid of 70 million cars. That's what energy efficient refrigerators have done. This is not something that's happening only in the West. In India's case as well, LED bulbs, which are about 75% more efficient than incandescent ones, in the last few years, due to a Government of India program to ensure that bulbs get replaced by LEDs, we have been able to distribute 36 crore bulbs, which has led to 15 lakh cars being taken off the road, which is the number of cars in Bangalore. Imagine if you could wish away all the cars in Bangalore at this instant. That is what bulbs have done, right? This energy efficiency can be observed outside of our homes too. Our cars have become more efficient over time. We see that buildings, if buildings are constructed in a certain manner where the best energy efficiency design principles are incorporated, we see that we can reduce at least 50% of the energy that is used. The Empire States building, just a few years ago, underwent a renovation where they changed the windows and they added some layers so that you know air conditioning bills can be brought down. They're saving 38% in energy bills every year, which also means that they're saving substantial amounts of emissions, which will obviously contribute to our efforts against climate change. We see that in the case of metals, if we are able to recycle scrap metal, uh, in the case of iron and steel, we can save up to 70% emissions. In the case of aluminum, we can save up to 90% emissions by ensuring that all scraps are recycled. Unfortunately, there is currently no existing policy that mandates that scrap should be recycled. Energy efficiency is also a big one. In India, there's a scheme already called the Perform Achieve Trade, PAT, P-A-T. This scheme by the government of India uh, has tried to get major polluting industry to cut down on their emissions and their energy use. Under this scheme, only in these four years between 2012 and 2015, we have been able to remove the equivalent of 12 lakh cars of the Indian roads. So what this means is that since 2015, there have been even more gains made. We just don't have the data yet. Our hope is in the next few weeks and months, we'll be able to collect and, and quantify that data. So what have all these great advances led to? It has led to a situation where in the year 2017, emissions were 12% less than they otherwise would have been on the accounts of energy efficiency alone, which means that India, remember, India is the world's third largest emitting country. We have reduced one India-sized source of greenhouse gases in the 15 or 17 years before last year. Therefore, even though GDP has more than doubled since the year 2000, this is global GDP, more than doubled since the year 2000, energy use has not increased by as much. It's only been a fraction of the rise. This is because energy efficiency has been leading to some certain gains. But unfortunately, and unsurprisingly, we're not doing enough. Only about one third of the energy that is used globally has any form of energy efficiency mandates onto it right now. That is two thirds of the energy that is used, two thirds of the appliances, two thirds of everything, be it transport, be it industry, buildings. We are not being able to use this energy efficiency. We are not being able to ensure that we are minimizing emissions across the board. This is what the opportunity is. The opportunity is ensure that all energy we use is the best possible way we are using it. Which is also why the target of 3%, so we need to ensure that energy intensity to the GDP increases by 3% year after year after year. Unfortunately, we have been falling well short. In all the years in the recent past, we have missed this 3% target. 
The way we can get there is, is by ensuring that energy efficiency is at the heart of every climate action plan globally. Not just globally, not at just at the national level, but at the state level, at the city level, at the level of your companies, at the level of your households. Energy efficiency should be at the core of this. I'll end with a quote which was uh, said by Dr. Fatih Birol, who's the executive director of the International Energy Agency. He said that energy efficiency is the one energy resource that all countries share in abundance. That is, there's no Saudi Arabia of energy efficiency. There, no one's gonna get rich, no one's, no country is gonna get rich, but we all can contribute to it, we all have it. We all have to ensure that we are being, doing the best we possibly can. And for that reason, I conclude, the most invisible thing about energy may just save the world. Thank you.